Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Brendan Woodruff, co-chair of the Operations and Engagement Subcommittee. I'd like to thank everybody for jumping on our latest uh, sustainability series webinar here today. Uh, we're lucky to have Dan Gilrain from Cornell Cooperative Extension talking about landscaping pests and what you can do to manage them sustainably. A couple of announcements before we get started today. Um, first, Green Your Commute Day is on Friday, so if you haven't registered yet, please do. Uh, we're trying to get record participation this year, um, so make sure that you get registered and um, kind of nudge your coworkers to get registered as well. Um, if you need any more information on that, you can go to DEC's website and search for Green Your Commute, and it will come up with the registration form and a whole bunch of resources for transit agencies, bike, um, how to find bike paths and bike directions walking, carpooling info, uh, and everything else. So uh, a couple of housekeeping items as we get started here today. If you do have questions, please type them into the chat box. We'll get to those at the end of the webinar. Uh, there will be plenty of time for Q&A. Um, in addition, this webinar is being recorded and it will be put up on the Green New York website once we're finished, uh, along with all of the other ones. If you want to see any of the webinars in our series, feel free to go to the Green New York website uh, they are right on the main page about halfway down. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Dan here, who's going to talk about landscape pests. Thanks a lot for being on today, Dan. Oh, great. Thank you very much, Brendan. And it's great to be with you all uh, and out there in Webland. Um, and as he said, I'm the extension entomologist with uh, Cooperative Extension here in Suffolk County. And uh, I work a lot with our landscape professionals, arborists, as well as our food crop growers, grapes, uh, and pumpkins, and everything uh, in, uh, you can imagine. So uh, talk about some of our my experiences with dealing with pest management in landscapes uh, and a little bit on vegetable and gardens and other things too. Um, and the title here is, If You Plant It, They Will Come. Uh, very apt if you're an entomologist uh, because you get uh, certainly a lot of insects that come in um, as well as the other visitors you would otherwise like to have. Um, so moving on here, I can get the presentation. Well, there we go. Um, gardens provide us a lot of pleasure um, for many reasons. They're enjoyable, calm uh, places to relax, uh, peaceful spots. Uh, we like to see the plants grow. Maybe we grow flowers or we grow vegetables uh, or things just to look at. Um, and uh, you can see the sign here. This is uh, one that was set up in Riverhead near our facility. Uh, cut flowers are a, a big business out this area. Uh, other reasons we grow plants uh, for food here, you can see potatoes, there's pawpaws, uh, raspberries, and tomatoes, things we'd like to have in our gardens. Um, gardens are like uh, outdoor living areas. Uh, that's a, a way some landscape architects really look at them, places to go and live in and be in and not just to look at from a distance. Uh, so this is kind of a place that invites you in to experience and enjoy and to see things, uh, to look at the plants, look at whatever uh, other wildlife is around there. Um, and so if you plant a garden, you'll get other things that come in, like robins here, or one things that wildlife will use your garden areas. And you'll also see other things that are often welcome too, insects that will come in to enjoy the garden that often our uh, plants are deliberately planted to bring these kinds of things in. Uh, this is a Promethea moth. This is one that was in my landscape uh, that uh, was uh, feeding, the caterpillar stage was feeding on some of the trees, and I just finished rearing it out so I could see what the moth looked like. So if you um, have landscapes that are diverse, you will invite these kinds of uh, things there that add dimensions to uh, beyond just the plants themselves. Here's a flame skimmer dragonfly. You'll see beautiful creatures like this that are often coming in and, and welcome uh, in, in the landscape too. Pollinators is a, are, are also welcome uh, in the landscape. They're necessary in many cases if you want to have apples, if you want to have uh, squash. These are things you want to see in your garden and, uh, and they can be very welcome indeed. Squash bees are important for pollinating cucurbits, uh, zucchini and so forth. And uh, they're very gentle. You'll see them uh, most of the time when you plant any any of these kinds of plants. So these will be things that will come also into your into your landscape. Other sort of natural enemies, beneficial insects we hear about, uh, lady beetles on the left, on the upper right is a aphid feeding midge, a little fly larva that's attacking the aphids there. So those are welcome too. There is a hornworm caterpillar on the right that has been parasitized by wasps that is uh, controlling that pest. And on the left are some flies. And you, if you look carefully at their little abdomens, you can see some uh, um, fungal spores that are sticking out. This is a, an insect killing fungus called 
Entomophthora that is killing these uh, seed corn maggot flies. Seed corn maggot is a pest of peas and beans and corn feeds on the seeds and uh, it causes a lot of damage, uh, prevents them from germinating. Um, you'll see some other things that are interesting too. This is actually a robber fly, not a bumblebee, but it's a bumblebee mimic. And you'll notice when you're uh, out there that it's not behaving like a bumblebee. It doesn't act like it's interested in flowers or pollen. It's uh, sitting and perching on high points on plants because it's a predaceous insect. It's looking for things to fly by that it can go and pounce on. This is a sample that I got one day. This is a, a piece of a flowering cherry twig. And you can see there's a caterpillar trying to act like a twig there. And you'll see these kinds of things that surprise you. The adult form also is a mimic of a dry leaf. You can see it there. There's a purplish brown looper. So these are some of the common things as you start to look that you'll begin to notice. Um, you'll see things that maybe are a little less welcome. This is bean aphid that's causing some distortion and curling on the uh, twigs uh, and the foliage of midwinter fire dogwood. You'll see some ants that are attending there. Um, and if you would like to have lady beetles, you should have aphids as well that keeps them around and keeps them uh, well fed. There are some other pests that are perhaps less welcome than aphids uh, in that case. Uh, this is fall webworm. We were having pretty serious outbreaks of this this past year. This is uh, distressing just because of the amount of aesthetic uh, injury it seems to be causing. It probably is not causing that level of actual damage to the plant. It may be weakening them to some extent more the, the concern would be to newly established plants, but ones that have been established for a while, such as uh, this, these are Korean lilacs, uh, would not be uh, nearly as affected. But it, it, it certainly is affecting the appearance and looks pretty pretty bad. There are pests, of course, that are much worse, and these can actually kill plants if they're present. This is hemlock woolly delgate, of course. This is what you would see in winter. These egg masses start to grow and become more obvious. This would be one kind of thing you'd be, want to be alert to and get it under control because it will kill the plant that it's on eventually. Um, there will be questions as you're looking. What are you looking at? What are these plants or what are these pests or what are these disease problems? You can bring samples to the diagnostic lab. This is our diagnostic lab page with Cornell Cooperative Extension of Suffolk County. And there are diagnostic labs in extension offices around the state. There's also uh, statewide serving ones at the university as well. So if you don't have one serving you in your county, you can send samples up to the uh, college in Ithaca and they'll take care of it there. Um, you'll also probably want some references that you can have on your own. Here are some that I use. This uh, one to the left are for home gardens using uh, cultural methods as well as what the pest, other pest management guidelines there are for dealing with uh, landscape and household pests. On the right is a really excellent book uh, that's just come out now in the second edition, A Garden Insects of North America, with really great photos of a lot of the things you're likely to see in gardens. So these are just two things that, uh, uh, kinds of things that you could have as references from here on. There was a recent feature in BBC, and this is a photo taken of that page, um, uh, concerning plant blindness. And I think one of the cures for dealing with plant and pest problems is to become more aware of the plants around us in the environment. Um, this is a phenomenon that people tend to not really look at the plants. They're seen more as structural, and we don't pay a lot of close attention to them. But in gardens, gardens are certainly a place where we want to pay a lot more attention to plants and see how they're doing, what's bothering them, what's on them. So uh, just being aware of them and what they need, what they require, is key to keeping them healthy and maintaining them uh, for the long term. These are just some examples of insults that have, I have seen in my period of time. On the left, as there is um, actual physical injury from a lawnmower on a uh, bark of a cherry tree, and there is road salt that was left in a bag over the roots of an oak tree, and I'm sure that oak tree was heavily damaged. There's probably a canker at the base of that from the roots that were killed below that very concentrated salt that was placed there. Mulch is a great idea for landscape plants. It keeps the mowings and other equipment away, and it helps to protect the roots, and it helps retain soil moisture and keep it moderated over the course of the season. This is overdoing it on the mulch. This is not what we want to see. I see this pretty commonly here. Um, but this is home for voles to come and uh, feed at the bark at the base of the tree. It also reduces the oxygen levels to the roots right near the base of the tree there. And there are a lot of roots that are functional there normally, except when they're uh, overlain by a heavy layer of mulch like this. This is a landscape in the Hamptons. This is a typical situation I get to deal with. This, uh, there's a lot of attention paid to the grass. You can see there's not a weed in sight there. But the grass is getting overwatered, uh, excessively irrigated. 
Um, and I can tell that when I go there, there's you squishing as you go along in the landscape and you see that there's uh, overly moist areas. But the problem that I was brought in to deal with is this one. The trees were looking like this. You can see they're yellowed. There is edge burn on the leaves. And this is not because of uh, excess fertilizer or lack of fertilizer. It's because that the roots are suffering and the entire trees are looking like this as a consequence. Uh, as is often the case in residential landscapes, there is a hard pan um, below the surface where drainage is poor, and especially in other areas around the state that don't have the good draining soil that we have here, this could even be a bigger issue. Uh, often when, of course, of grading the land during construction or other work, you get this hard pan, um, and that impedes the drainage. And that was the problem with these trees. So we advised some corrective actions to help deal with that, uh, also to look at the irrigation more carefully so that uh, it wasn't being used uh, too much uh, um, and only just enough as needed. Pay attention to what plants, uh, other plants else might be telling you. This plant obviously doesn't look too healthy. The problem is the zinc deficiency. And we figured that out because we looked at the pH and, uh, and uh, we couldn't find any other problems. The roots actually looked really, really good on this plant. And we took a soil sample and uh, also foliar sample that was deficient uh, in, in zinc and then the soil uh, pH was too high. And you could see this is this a nutrient availability chart um, that tells you when plant nutrients become more or less available according to pH. So learn what kind of pH ranges your plants will tolerate what's ideal. Um, and we get these questions all the time. They're sent to me because they think there's maybe an insect problem involved, but a lot of times it's a cultural and management issue instead. This is a case that was thought to be Dutch elm disease, but uh, the tree on the right is, is where it's from. Um, you can see in the distance there is a water area in the background that had flooded over, and then the owners decided to put a uh, paved area around the tree. So this damaged the roots right around the base of the tree, further harming it, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> pardon me, and um, it caused this dieback, which looks an awful lot like Dutch elm disease. Obviously, this is not a very appropriate site for arborvitae to be planted along the roadside. It represents a hazard. There's a lot of heat uh, radiated from the roadside. There's very poor water infiltration, so the plants aren't going to do well, besides probably being totally illegal. Uh, on the right is a blueberry that was planted way too deeply, so the lower roots have died, and the plant was suffering uh, with yellowed foliage, stunting. It just uh, had a lot of dieback, and there's some roots that are starting to take over, but in the meantime, the plant is looking pretty bad just because it was planted way too deeply. There's a zone right here, I think if you can see my pointer, just above where the lower roots are, and that's where the soil line should have been, but instead it was about six inch, eight inches above that point. Um, this is a plant that has an insect infestation. On the lower right, you can see this little area with a little sawdust. That's where a little bark beetle went in. Um, it's called the cedar bark beetle. But this had been planted in July uh, on a berm in a very, very warm, t dry time of year. And we, we had a sort of a record drought summer, I believe, that year as well. So these plants, which are already missing a lot of roots when they're transplanted, was further stressed out by the site and the conditions. And uh, the bark beetles sensed that and went in for the attack. It, so the problem was really not the insect infestation. It was that the plants were planted at the wrong time in very drought, droughty type conditions and weren't given a very good chance to get going. Well, this may look good to us. It looks even better to sycamore lace bugs. Uh, and other pests and diseases of sycamore like anthracnose. So I think we need to change the way we look at landscapes and the way we design and plan them so that we're not putting in smorgasbords for individual pest problems. Um, and uh, this will tell you exactly why. This is a, a case in Bristol, Connecticut showing ash trees that are being decimated by emerald ash borer. And I'm sure some of you and uh, elsewhere in New York are seeing this as we are here on Long Island where uh, there were beautiful alleys of trees planted that are now going down uh, from uh, this invasive pest. This is herbicide injury. Uh, it was brought to me as a possible boxwood leaf miner problem, but there was a broadcast spreader uh, herbicide applied over the grass uh, when the foliage of the boxwoods were wet. And so you can see there's kind of a line around this middle section below which the foliage is yellow because the granules were sticking on the foliage after the application. This is due to a 2,4-D application to the grass to control broadleaf weeds. And the 2,4-D uh, material can be 
uh, uh, volatile and, uh, and the uh, vapors were coming out of the grass uh, for after the herbicide application and affecting the uh, woody plants nearby. So this was thought to be an insect problem, like an area of mite, but it turns out to be herbicide. So take good care of your plants uh, and they'll, they'll take care of you too. This is a herbicide injury from a herbicide that was applied around the base of the plants to control broadleaf weeds and the mulch, but it uh, can wash down and be taken up into roots and you'll get the consequences later on the following year, as you see there. This is a, her a horticultural oil application to hemlock, and you can see one zone there that is facing to the southwest in the most uh, direct sun, and that's where the damage occurred. This was applied in fall, and oil is never a good idea applied in fall. I know some people do that and can get away with it, but I really do not suggest using dormant oil in the fall, um, on, particularly on, on evergreens, for this reason, because the uh, foliage can desiccate in the winter, and then you get this damage showing up later on. Um, we're trying to use less insecticides, but today a lot of the ones we have are much better than the ones we used to have. And there are some softer and gentler ones in the, in the home garden. There's a list of ones that uh, I know of here that you could use, and these can be very effective when used in the right way at the right time. Uh, so you have to be careful. Um, if you're going to use them, um, don't um, overuse them or broadcast to a larger area than absolutely needed. And think about the timing. Are there bees present that could be harmed from the use of these uh, and so on? So t uh, timing can be pretty important. Plant safety can be an issue with some of the newer products, especially some of the so-called organic ones that we're hearing about. I do a lot of tests on these, and there's a, a one product we tested called Indoor Farm that pretty much burned the flowers off of the plants, as you can see here on the right. Uh, this is a product that worked very well to control the aphids, but it also was uh, somewhat damaging to the plant, and we just need to sometimes work on finding lower rates or other products or, that are safer for use on plants that we're targeting. And if you're going to use any of these insecticides, uh, be aware of where they might be going with off-site movement, like down storm drains that could be direct routes to groundwater. So in dealing with different landscape pest problems, think about the key plants that are important to you and the key pests that bother those. Uh, you can find lists of these online, and this is just one little list that I put together just based upon my own experience. So you can see I'm showing that arborvitae is typically prone to spruce spider mite and arborvitae leaf miner. Boxwood leaf mi boxwoods, we see boxwood leaf miner, boxwood spider mite, and boxwood psyllids on, and so forth. So by having a list of these in mind, you have an idea what to look for or what to be aware of when um, out in the landscape, what kinds of problems plants are prone to and which plants tend to get more problems. So this uh, will help you in uh, dealing with these and anticipating them and reacting quickly before they become too serious. And you can make similar lists for fruit trees, uh, berries, and here's a list for vegetable crops as well. Just to talk about a few things, at least in the vegetable and the food garden, um, there's some things we, we're dealing with here uh, commercially, um, flea beetles, uh, worms on cabbage, uh, and uh, cabbage maggot there on the lower part of the screen as well. These can be pretty serious problems. One thing we found works really, really well is this screening. Uh, this is a commercial horticulture netting that's being sold. You can buy this at different um, on, online or from different uh, retailers. And we found that it works really, really well to prevent all of these different pests. So put on early enough in the spring or shortly after planting, and you won't see any, of, any problems with any of these. Uh, you can also use this to control cucumber beetles on cucurbits. After a while, you do have to lift the screening or at least the side of it so that bees can come in and pollinate the flowers. But at least during the early establishment period, when plants are particularly sensitive, you could have problems with striped cucumber beetle and the netting uh, screening will help eliminate that. Another thing to look at is when you're uh, buying seeds or buying plants, look for things that have different levels of resistance or different kinds of resistance. I'm just showing one kind of uh, cucumber here called little leaf has resistance to bacterial wilt. Uh, this is a uh, bacterial disease that is transmitted by cucumber beetles and spread that way often causes these plants to go downhill pretty quickly in the summertime. So by buying a, a variety of seed that is, uh, has the built-in resistance, then you shouldn't see nearly a severe problem with it. Squash vine borer is another case of one that or the netting or screening can be very helpful when these first come out around 900 degree days, which is around mid-June or so. And that's the moth on the upper left and the eggs that it laid on the right. So you can watch for those on the plants if, you, if they're uncovered. But if you use a row cover or screening, that will help 
prevent them. If you don't get around to that, and uh, you do, or you do have to lift the cover eventually anyway to let in uh, bees for pollination, you can use a BT material or a spinosad insecticide after those adults emerge around 900 gig days in um, after about mid-June or so is when those eggs are laid, and that's when the materials can be applied to get control of that. Uh, and there's other things you can do. You can open up stems that have the larvae inside and kill them that way, and, uh, and that can stop it in its tracks as well. Um, hornworms are really common in gardens. Uh, BT materials and spinosad insecticides work really well. Um, you can just hand remove them. And if you see one with the cocoons on the upper right, you could just leave it uh, because that's not going to be doing any more feeding. And the little parasitoid, parasitoid wasps will be emerging out of those cocoons looking for more caterpillars to parasitize. So if you see those, just leave them there and the natural enemies will be there to help you. Apple maggot is a common pest on uh, apples, and you can see the damage it's causing on the upper left there. You can control these without any insecticide just by putting out three of these sticky red spheres. The flies, the apple maggot flies, uh, think this is a ripe apple and uh, will come to it and get stuck on it, and that will stop them. So without any insecticide at all, you can control them. Just put three of these in, in each of your apple trees, and that should do it. Raspberry cane girdle is one we see in small fruit here in raspberries, uh, and you can see the damage there. It makes these two girdled areas on either side of where it lays an egg, and so if you just prune those out below the bottom girdled spot, you can eliminate that entirely. The adult beetle that causes it is shown on the lower right, and if you see those, you can just hand remove those too. Um, they're fairly easy to catch. Raspberry cane borer is one we see in gardens as well. You can see these kind of swollen areas barely. Often the cane dies above that point, so it makes it easier to see that. This is a different kind of beetle that causes it. So just prune these out below the area where these galled areas, these swollen areas are, and destroy that, bury it, and that should be the that should help uh, control it or be the end of that. Cottle potato beetle is another one you can control just by removing uh, the adults or the larvae by hand or knocking them into some soapy water um, to destroy them that way. Uh, mulch seems to help in deterring the adults when they're coming out from their overwintering areas, but they can eventually find plants in mulched areas anyway. On the upper right is one that has been killed by a natural fungus called Bovaria, and this you often see in landscapes, uh, in uh, home gardens, I mean, and uh, we've seen it pretty often in commercial fields here on Long Island. If uh, you have a really heavy infestation or a large area, there are other insecticides you can use. Some contain spinosad, some contain azadiractin, one of the neem type of products, and those can work very, very well, uh, targeting for larvae especially. Uh, we're getting more complaints about this one. This is beet or spinach leaf miner, and um, you can see the mines that it's causing in beets. It's Swiss chard, spinach. Uh, remove those by hand early when you first start to see them, and usually that should stop it for the rest of the year. Viburnum leaf beetle, getting into the landscape, other ornamental plants, uh, Viburnum leaf beetle has become a more of a serious problem, an invasive species from Europe that's now widely established around the northeast, and there's the beetles on the right and the larvae on the lower left there. These get started in the spring, they overwinter as eggs in twigs, and the one I've circled there is a twig that has had eggs laid into it, and the larvae emerged out of that to go feed on the leaves nearby, and you can see the holes they left behind. So if you're aware of that, you can prune out, look, look for those little egg niches in those twigs if you've had viburnum leaf beetle and prune those off before they emerge or look very early in the spring for that early damage to the youngest leaves and hand remove or knock the larvae off before they cause much further injury. Uh, there are some insecticides you can use. The uh, spinosad material I mentioned earlier can work very well if you target the larvae. It doesn't work too well on the adults, but if you get the larvae, that can be a pretty effective one, and it's uh, organic as well. Uh, the best option is to use resistant plants, and there are a number of viburnums that are resistant to viburnum leaf beetle, and the most susceptible ones are shown above, and there's some resistant ones down below. So if you're choosing to grow viburnums, I would say use some of these ones from the resistant category, and you shouldn't be seeing problems with viburnum leaf beetle. Boxwood leaf miner is a problem we get a lot of questions about, and uh, that uh, ranging all around the state. Box is pretty widely used because it's resistant to deer. The good news is that there are also resistant varieties. Uh, we put a uh, list of these on our website at Cooperative Extension of Suffolk County. This is based on three years of observations in Virginia, and some of these varieties are uh, pretty good, even further north from there. Uh, we've shown you the different ratings um, and the number of years, and there's a more extensive list on our website, along with this uh, boxwood pest guide 
Um, so this could be helpful to you as well. So if you have a choice and you're trying to plant boxwoods, use something like Varda Valley or Newport Blue. Those are good varieties that do not get boxwood leaf miner. Um, if you have some boxwoods and you have to deal with this, there is a, a, a couple of ways you can manage it. There are the emerging leaf miner larvae. You can see one of them coming out on the upper right there. In the middle, some have already emerged. You see the empty pupil cases. And on the lower left, I have circled uh, one of the blisters of the mines where the miner has not yet emerged. So this is right at the beginning of when the miners are emerging in spring. This usually happens around the end of May here. Um, and you can treat for these with insecticidal soap or insecticide containing acetamiprid. This, although it's a neonicotinoid, it has a very, very low toxicity to honeybees and uh, very fairly specific for this. So you could treat with that, just direct that to the leaf, leaf undersides. Uh, if you're using insecticidal soap, you'll probably need to repeat the application several times over the course of when these flies are active uh, around late May to early June. So later on in summer, if you miss that timing, you'll see these little mines or blisters begin to form under the leaves, and you can use the same uh, acetamiprid material that uh, works pretty well, uh, we found, at this timing. You have to direct it to the leaf undersides, and then maybe include a wetting agent to help it uh, adhere to the foliage even better. Arborvitae leaf miner is a common problem all around the state. We see quite a bit of this on Arborvitae, and I like Arborvitae uh, quite a bit. As a landscape plant, it's tough. It seems to have relatively few problems. This is one, one that it does get, and it can cause some pretty serious thinning, as you'll see here. Um, this is what it will look like in summer when you get these early mines that form, just causing a beginning browning. This doesn't draw a lot of attention, but we get the complaints typically later in fall when the damage shows up even more or the following spring when it becomes really, really obvious. The time to really manage this is not now, but more like late June when these moths are out. You can see one of the moths on the upper left here. If you miss that timing, you can go out uh, later on in uh, summer around late July through August, even into September we found you can use uh, uh, spinosad at any of these timings and it seems to provide pretty good control. Um, if you're going to use the spinosad insecticide, just wet down the foliage very, very thoroughly, maybe include a wetting agent if it's not adhering uh, very well. There's a close-up of what one of the, uh, the moths looks like, gives you a sense of the size. Watch for those around the end of June, and uh, spinosad applied around that time can be very, very effective, and it's one of the safer, gentler kinds of materials. As I mentioned, it is organic, so that would be a, a really good option to use for this particular pest. Be aware that some browning on foliage of arborvitae may not be, entire, may not be from leaf miner. This is uh, a plant that's under some serious drought stress, or there's maybe a problem with the roots that are not functioning, and so you can get this kind of browning symptom as well. Uh, if you have a hand lens or can look very closely, you could actually tell that the foliage is not mined. It's not hollowed out at all like it would be with leaf miner. There's a distinction there. So this uh, is very definitely from drought stress, uh, at least in a case here uh, in a landscape where the uh, soil was uh, pretty dry and sandy. There are some resistant varieties, not too many, but we do know that uh, at least Hoopsii and the Hetz Midget, these are smaller varieties, don't have as much of a problem or not as prone to uh, arborvitae leaf miners. So these might be options if you're considering planting um, arborvitae to maybe use these uh, preferred over some of the others like um, Smarag, which is actually uh, emerald green. It's the other name of it is emerald green. And that's widely grown here, but it is very, very susceptible and shows damage very quickly. Uh, scale insects can be a real problem on landscape plants. This is called white prunicola scale. This is on privet, but we also see this on lilac and flowering cherry trees. These are the adult females you're seeing right here. One way to deal with these is use a brush. And there's one person there that's brushing them off of a lilac tree uh, when they're seen later in summer. You can even power wash these off. We have uh, landscape professionals and arborists that are doing that to take off these heavy end crustaceans with um, um, just the forceful water from a spray or from a power washer. Um, if you're going to use a power washer, just be careful not to take the bark off as well. You want to uh, use it sort of gently uh, just to get the scales off. Um, generally, at late winter, early spring is probably the best time of year to do that, but you can do it other times as long as you're careful to, to watch, uh, watch the foliage. We do use uh, other things to control it. Uh, horticultural oil can work well at dormant stage or later on when the eggs hatch and the crawlers are out, which would be around the 
middle to late part of June and later again in July for white pruna colda scale. In this case, I'm showing a picture of some scales uh, on a, it's a soft scale on holly that has been killed by hort uh, dormant stage horticultural oil. This would again be an organic option you could use. You could see a lot of them looking kind of crispy there. And there's a couple that are still looking alive on that one leaf. On the left shows the scales overwintering on the twigs, which is normally where you'll see them um, in the late winter, very early spring, and they eventually move to the foliage. And, um, and these were treated in mid-April uh, when most of them were on the foliage and uh, provided really, really good control. And if you missed that timing, you can go later on when the eggs hatch. Um, this case, we're looking at cottony hydrangea scale. And these are the tiny little crawlers, the little baby scales that have hatched from the eggs. And they're very sensitive to everything. Even just washing them off with uh, a jet of water from a hose will take care of quite a few of them. Insecticidal soap or a horticultural oil can also take care of these as well. Um, and the timing for different scales is going to be different for each one. You can learn about those with the Cornell guidelines, or there's some online references that can help you know when to expect those to be present. Little leaf beetle is one that we have here, and we're seeing quite a bit of that now spreading around Long Island. Uh, there's also, of course, around upstate. And the beetles that are on the right, those are active right now, and they'll be laying eggs pretty soon. On the upper left are some of the larvae that uh, have uh, hatched uh, from those eggs, and they'll feed and cover themselves with their droppings. So they not only defoliate the plants, but they're pretty disgusting to look at and, and pretty objectionable. Um, you can hand pick the beetles here. You can hand pick the larvae if you're feeling a little intrepid. One of the things that we're doing is using a biocontrol. Um, we're releasing that here, and there's several places around the state where that's been done as well. This uh, little tiny wasp that you can see on the lower right is uh, resting on one of the larvae that's covered with its own droppings, and somehow that doesn't de deter this little little tiny wasp, and it's laying eggs in it. And uh, we're hoping that that'll provide very good control, as it has done elsewhere in New England. Um, if uh, these are not sold, you can't buy them, but we're releasing them in several areas around the state, so hopefully they will take off and, and do the job. In the meantime, you can treat for that, or if you're not hand removing, um, spinosad or zataractin uh, based insecticides uh, are also organic and they can be used to target the larval stage and should give you some control there. There's some pests that are just worth ignoring, and this is one, a fairly new one that we're seeing on daylily called daylily leaf miner, and you can see the mines that it's creating on the leaf, and that's the little uh, daylily leaf miner adult fly on the right. So this is the kind of thing that doesn't seem to bother the plants. They seem to go on uh, happily as, as ever and blooming and doing just fine. So this is the kind of thing that is, might be considered a pest if you're a daylily specialist, but uh, it's not such a serious problem at all. A little more damaging is this one called daylily thrips. Uh, it's a specific thrips that likes daylilies, and you can see the kind of distortion and damage it's causing on the flowers on the right and the buds in the upper left. There's an image, a little fuzzy, showing what the thrips looks like. You can actually catch them in the act sometimes, tap the flowers or the, the early opening buds um, over a white paper or, or a board, and you can try to see them that way. Um, you can use uh, spinosad to treat and control these, but the best thing is really to think about resistant varieties. We did some um, um, a little study of varieties that we found to be tolerant or resistant to daily thrips, and there's a short list of some that were resistant in our trial here. Um, this is one you can control. This is white pine weevil and the damage that it causes on uh, white pines, and it will also go after uh, spruces, uh, blue spruce, and Norway spruce, and other ones too. Uh, this terminal is very diagnostic and distinctive. It attacks the upper uh, year, first years of growth or so. And pruning these out before the end of June and destroying it uh, uh, should provide pretty good control, uh, generally speaking, unless you have sources outside. There are bark sprays that you can use if necessary, but usually just pruning this out is enough to control it in a landscape situation. We see a lot of spruce spider mites on conifers, different conifers. Uh, in this case, it's on dwarf Alberta spruce, one that is really, really prone to it. And unfortunately, when it gets it, they uh, often uh, turns the foliage brown and you get this defoliation that happens. So they can make the plant look pretty bad. Spruce spider mites are out about now. It's about when the eggs are hatching this time of year. They like the cool weather generally of spring and also late summer, fall. These are times generally when these mites tend to be most active. You'll see them also during 
during the summer, during cooler times of year usually. Uh, in hot summers, they don't tend to be as much of a problem. But the time of year uh, around late to May would be when to look for them. You can tap branches of, a, of host plants over whiteboard or paper to look for them. They'll get dislodged and then uh, you can see them much more easily that way and tell when they're, when they're active. So if you had a problem with them, that's one way to find them and you can treat for them with insecticidal soap or horticultural oil. There are some conifers that are sensitive to those. So it might be even simpler just to get out your garden hose and to wash the plants down with a really vigorous uh, jet spray and that takes a lot of the mites off. And you don't have to worry about them crawling back up. A lot of them, when they get off the plant or on the ground, they won't survive and they won't become a problem again. Uh, while we're looking at conifers, you might see this one. It's called red-headed pine sawfly. This is a real common pest. Uh, sawflies turn into insects that are uh, closely related to bees and wasps. They don't turn into butterflies or moths. And uh, often they conveniently congregate in these large groups. And so you can just prune them off or hand remove them. That's probably the easiest way. Uh, spinosad insecticides tend to, uh, can work very, very well also to control them if there's a much bigger job than just removing one or two or, or several branches or with caterpillar sauna. Uh, rose slugs are a different kind of a saw fly, but related. And you can see some on the upper left there. They cause this kind of these small holes and windows in the foliage. The key is to look for this early, not after the uh, damaged areas turn brown and the caterpillars, the soft lights, are no longer present. But the same material spinosa would work for them as well. And if it's just a little bit on a few leaves, you can hand remove them, but often um, there's many, and in that case, the spinosa and insecticide might be the best and safest option for, for that particular problem. These are some milkweed aphids, very colorful on the swamp milkweed. And notice that there's a couple of lady beetle larvae here that are using them. So you may uh, look at them as helpful. The aphids are actually helpful by attracting lady beetles and keeping them around. But if there's too many, you could try rinsing some of these off uh, just with a jet of water, uh, leaving some for the lady beetles behind. You can use insecticidal soap as well, and possibly even horticultural oil would work in some cases too for this. Just coat them well, and that should take care of quite a few of them. Eastern tent caterpillar is one we often see this time of year. You'll see those tents that are forming on plants right now. There's years when we have outbreaks. Uh, this is not one for us, but we've had, we just come through one uh, where there was quite a bit of it. And just removing those tents by hand, uh, um, do not burn them out as I was uh, taught when I was very young, but just remove those by hand. Um, if you are out even earlier in the spring, look for the egg masses that are up in the upper left there and just prune those off or peel those off the twigs and that should uh, eliminate the problem. If uh, none of those are satisfactory, BT materials or spinosa also work to control the caterpillars very, very well. We had one clever uh, master gardener that uh, was controlling slugs in this manner. There are slug, slug baits as well, some of them containing iron-based compounds that are used in organic gardening and they can work fairly well as well. Um, I have some box turtles that are, seem to be taking care of the problem in my landscape, and so a few slugs are welcome uh, there just to keep them uh, fed. Just the last couple of things I'll mention here, uh, hemlock woolly delgid uh, has been a, a bigger problem, becoming a bigger problem around the state and more areas are finding it and discovering it. And this will kill hemlocks. Um, look for these egg masses in spring. That'll be the most obvious stage right around this time of year. And there are several treatments listed there, horticultural oil, insecticidal soap, and some other insecticides that do work pretty well too. But the oil or soap would be your organic options. Just be sure to coat the foliage very, very well. If it's a very large tree, I might suggest bringing in an arborist or landscape professional to help deal with that. They may need to use some kind of a targeted systemic um, rather than one of these other ones if uh, um, spraying is not really an option. And avoid using nitrogen fertilizer around the base of the tree because this tends to feed the problem rather than help the plant. So just be aware of that. Bronze birch borer has been a common problem because we were using a lot of European birches at one time and no longer because they would always, always die from bronze birch borer. <clears throat> Instead, what people are growing is um, River birch, that seems to be the most common one now that's the replacement and they do very well. They do not get bronze birch borer. You could see what the beetles look like on the upper left and the galleries under the bark on the lower right that are very distinctive for this particular pest. Um, so heritage is one variety uh, of, um, of river birch that's resistant. Dura heat's another one that's uh, more common in southern areas. It's uh, more tolerant of warm conditions. And uh, river birch does very well throughout much of the state of New York. It would be an option to grow. And there's what the bark looks like on river birch. It's not as bright white, 
but it can still be very attractive and it as it gets older it peels and, and uh, looks pretty interesting so that might be an option to deal with that we're now dealing with emerald ash borer finally on long island a lot of other areas of the state have been dealing with it for several years um, since uh, 2009 at least and um, that's what the adult looks like and one of the d-shaped exit holes very distinctive for this uh, serious pest it kills ash trees and it also will attack a uh, fringe tree as well this is one of the pictures from one of our infested areas you could see the tree that's uh, been uh, um, had some damage from woodpeckers that are looking for the larvae beneath. You get this blonding on the bark, and there's the D-shaped exit hole on the right there from this particular tree. Um, we've, there's some canopy thinning. This is a symptoms of infestation, so uh, they attempt to like to tack further up in the canopy where it's hard to actually see some of these symptoms initially, but if you're seeing that the tree could be suffering from emerald ash borer. Um, when you get to some point like this, it may not be worth saving the tree, and maybe 40% or more of the canopy is involved. Uh, and even if the tree is saved, um, sometimes there'll be too much dieback to make it really a valuable specimen any longer. This, this epicormic branching you see at the base of the tree is also another symptom of attack. Uh, a lot of times the, the cambium or the inner bark above this point has been attacked and killed, and this, the, the uh, remaining part of the tree alive is down below that. Uh, you still may get live branches up above, but those will be dying back before too long. There's really no um, great, uh, easy organic type treatments for this. Um, the most effective options are trunk injections. There are uh, soil drenches with materials you can use as well, but probably the more environmentally conservative materials would be trunk injections. The most effective of those would be the ones that contain emamectin benzoate, uh, shown here as triage, arbamectin, entree, box, or mectocide, or tremect. These, uh, the one case I wanted to mention some of the materials, um, because this is, I think, uh, these are all the ones that are labeled and registered in the state of New York. Triazin is an organic version, and uh, some other ones are listed there too. Just a little bit on spotted lanternfly. Um, this is now a, a threat to the state of New York. We are watching for it. It's uh, focused in these areas in blue, shown in Pennsylvania, where the infestation is found, also western New Jersey. Um, the northern part of Delaware is under a uh, quarantine as well for it, and a little tip of northern Virginia is shown as well. Um, areas shown in orange are where spotted lanternflies have been seen, and, um, but there is no established populations in those areas yet, but it's showing signs of trying to get out of the uh, infested areas, so we're watching for it, and we'd like you to keep your eyes peeled for it as well. The adults shown there on the lower right, and there's egg masses on the upper left. Uh, these are the nymphal stages you'll see on, on trees and shrubs, so watch for them. And if you suspect you see them, you can send an email to uh, DEC, their spotted lanternfly at dec.ny.gov is the email address, or you can contact one of the Cornell Diagnostic Labs. There's a picture showing you what the egg masses look like. They're really hard to see on bark, but they could be laid on concrete and rusty surfaces and all kinds of things they'll be, they'll be on. So watch for this in, in, uh, this year and coming years, and if you suspect you have it, um, contact the DEC at that email or one of the diagnostic labs with Cornell and your county. And that's what I have, and I'd be delighted to entertain any questions anybody has. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, that was a, a really great presentation, and I really loved the uh, the pictures of everything. I'm kind of squirmished around insects myself, but it's okay. good, to, uh, okay. <laughs> good to get uh, acquainted with all of the pests that we have out there. So if people have questions, please type them into the chat box. We're going to be going through them now. I have a few initial ones here. Um, the first one is, uh, would you be able to make the slides available for folks uh, as like a PDF or something that they could look at afterwards? Um, I think, Brendan, you said it's recorded, so maybe it that's is. the best way to have that available um, in, in online that way so people can review them at leisure. Maybe that's mm -hmm. the simplest way. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's already there. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Um, so you mentioned pawpaws, and this is kind of getting off uh, track just a little bit here. Um, can you talk a little bit more about those and where those are in New York? I know um, there's been some media reports about, you know, the all-American fruit and stuff like that. Uh -huh. um, but, uh, yeah, it's not something we hear a lot about. Yeah, pawpaw is a native tree. Its relatives are all tropical. Uh, sour sap, sweet sap would be some of its relatives. Uh, and... Um, it's uh, interesting. Um, there apparently are some established native uh, pawpaws in the very western part of the state. 
um, in the Appalachians area there. I don't know specifically where those are, but there apparently are some there. Uh, but you can buy wild and cultivated varieties and grow them on your own. Um, I have some in my, my property. Um, the trees like to have a little bit of shade uh, to get started. Mine are actually in full sun, but they've been coddled all the way through their infancy and they're growing very well now. The um, um, plants are not prone to any insect or disease problems that I am really aware of that I've ever seen. There's a few things they'll feed on them, but they don't have very many pests. Um, the only issue I see is with raccoons or possums that like to feed on the fruit as they're ripening. So I sometimes have to work to keep them away from it so I can have some. <laughs> um, um, and they ripen pretty late. So um, I, I know that there's trees that will grow in Syracuse. Uh, probably much further north, they may not ripen well enough. Um, they, mine typically ripen around late September in into October, and I'm in one of the warmer areas of the state. But I do know people upstate uh, are growing them and they're getting fruit and doing, they're doing just fine. They have beautiful fall color. Uh, the flowers, which are out right now here, are very strange, uh, little bell-shaped reddish-brown ones. They're pollinated by flies. Um, and so. Uh, uh, I believe the, the odor is more of carrion. You can't, I can't actually detect that. I don't see that. But there's definitely flies that are interested that are buzzing around them, and that's how they're pollinated. So you want to grow a couple of varieties um, if you would like to get fruit so they can kind of cross-pollinate. Um, and I guess uh, any other questions uh, on that? I don't know. But uh, fruit is delicious. I, I like them. It's not everybody's cup of tea, but um, they have a flavor between something like a banana and mango. Uh, very unusual sort of tropical flavor uh, that I, I like quite well, and many, many people do. That's great. Yeah, I'm going to have to look for those. Mm -hmm. um, the next question here is, is neem, N-E-E-M, oil one of the oils you referred to? Um, Yes, it can be. I talked about horticultural oil, and generally what I have suggested is people look for a paraffinic, meaning a mineral oil um, derived from petroleum. Those would still be considered organic, but you can use a neem oil material, um, and I've used them very successfully. I would consider them approximately equivalent um, to other horticultural oils, uh, the mineral oils, and you can use them probably interchangeably. Um, there may be some label differences on some of the products. Some of the neem oil materials have some labeling for disease management as well. Um, the mineral oils will be often labeled for powdery mildew. Uh, that's one of the few diseases you'll see on the mineral oil, horticultural oil labels. Um, um, I think probably the other difference is that the mineral oils tend to volatilize probably a little better or faster over time, whereas the neem oils tend to stick around a little bit longer. That may not always be as good for plants, but um, with any of these things, there's always risk of some injury with either case, no matter which oil you use, just so be cautious. Read uh, the labels for sensitive plants and then just use them appropriately. Make sure they're mixed very well so you're not putting out some concentrated oil along with more dilute water. Um, so just be careful when making those applications. Uh, and also be aware if plants are under any kind of drought stress, uh, they're not healthy, um, conditions are very warm, like over 90 degrees, or there's risk of freezing, I would not use either neem oil or a uh, mineral oil, horticultural oil at those timings. Mm -hmm. Um, so the next question kind of touches a little bit on what we're going to talk about in our next uh, webinar on pollinator protections, but you mentioned at one point neonicotinoids, um, and I know there's um, some nurseries do treat their stock with that. Mm -hmm. Do you know if there's a way to avoid or to find out uh, if the plants you're purchasing have been treated with those? Well, I think directly uh, speak to the growers uh, express your concerns to them uh, what you're thinking about and um, talk to them about what you know what they've what they've used or whether the plants have been treated so I would say just talk directly to the garden center nursery where you're purchasing the plants to find out about that um, I'm part of a project where we're looking into this a little further I think the, the greater concern is if uh, if they're used sort of systemically if they're applied maybe early on prior to blooming, and now labels include prohibitions against such use, um, the idea that uh, being we don't want the material taken up into flowers, into pollen and nectar, where it could expose pollinators. Um, 
I mentioned the acetamiprid, that is a neonicotinoid, but it is not used in that way. It's used only as a spray, and it has very, very low toxicity to honeybees. So it's, it's the exception um, among the other, of all the neonicotinoids in that, in that fashion. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you're out of um, CCE at Suffolk County. If folks have questions in their local communities, um, are there offices or places they can go to for more assistance? Um, you mean other than you mean elsewhere in the state? Yeah. Um, yes. In the old days, of course, you would check the phone book under county offices and look for cooperative extension. Um, you can look online now. Search using. Um, you know, search using the county name and Cornell Cooperative Extension, and that should pull up the local county offices. And you can give them a call and speak to somebody there. Many of them do have uh, diagnostic uh, services they offer, or they can guide you to things like where to get a soil test or how to get that done. We have that information online on our page, actually, too. Um, so uh, search using your county name and Cornell Cooperative Extension, and that should pull up your county office uh, address and location and give them a call to see what services they can provide or if you or what or tell them what you need. Fantastic. And that is all the questions that we do have in the chat box here. Uh, do you have any final thoughts or uh, closing wisdom, Dan? Well, just say, happy spring. Get out and enjoy your gardens. Yep. So thanks, everybody, for jumping on the webinar today. Thanks again to Dan for taking the time to talk with us about this. Um, and a reminder that our next webinar is taking place on noon or at noon on Tuesday, June 11th, and it's on protecting pollinators. So stay tuned. Hopefully, we'll see the sun again. We'll be able to get out in our gardens and enjoy it. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye now.